There are 800,000 children in Jamaica, and a substantial number of them may be suffering from mental illness. Yet only a few are receiving the treatment they require due to several factors. This evening, we are here to elevate this conversation and shed light on the shortfalls of mental health services for children while assessing how the current fragmented approach to child mental health could place an exponentially bigger strain on the nation's resources in the years to come. I am Natasha Burnett, the communications officer at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, CAPRI. Welcome to our public policy forum for the launch of our report titled, Mind the Gap, the Inadequacy of Mental Health Services for Children. CAPRI is an independent think tank devoted to evidence-based research towards improved public policymaking in Jamaica and the Caribbean. The research that informed this report was carried out under the project Civil Society Organizations as Factors of Governance and Development, funded by the European Union. We thank the EU for their continued support. We believe that the findings and recommendations will increase your knowledge and enable informed discussions. To lead the conversation, we have brought together Dr. Diana Thorburn, Director of Research at Capri, Dr. Judith Leibo, Director of Child and Adolescent Mental Health at the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and Ms. Janine Brooks, Director of the Jamaica Mental Health Advocacy Network. The discussion will entail the presentation of the research findings by Dr. Thorburn, brief opening remarks by our panelists, followed by a question and answer segment to be moderated by Dr. Leanne Weaver, or Director of Advocacy. Mr. Ricard Vardia Divins, head of the European Union Corporation, will share his remarks. But first, we're inviting our participants to participate in a poll question. What percentage of children suffer from a mental illness in Jamaica? Mr. Ricard Bardia Divins, you may go ahead and share your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good evening to all and uh, a work a welcome to this new report from Capri. And uh, particularly a welcome to our host and panelists. Dr. Diana Thurburn, Director of Research at Capri, Dr. Judith Leiba, uh, Director of Child and Adolescent Mental Health at the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Ms. Janille Brooks, Director of the Jamaica Mental Health Advocacy Network, and uh, Tony Ann Robinson, main researcher. This report is the fifth of a total of 10 research papers that Capri is producing with uh, the financial support of the European Union as part of the project civil society organizations and as actors of governance and development for a period of uh, three years. As for other recent reports, we may agree or we may disagree with some of the findings and conclusions, but we cannot deny the importance of conducting an open and frank debate on the selected issues that are essential to achieving the goals of Vision 2030, the Jamaica National Development Plan. The issue that Capri selected for the report launched today is again of great significance and deserve all our attention. According to the World Health Organization definition, mental health is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. Mental health is our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It determines our ability to handle stress, relate to others, and make choices, 
which affect our health. Mental health is important at every stage of life, from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. Mental health is a global issue, yet it remains stigmatized and underfunded in almost every country. The current COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and increased the extent and severity of the global mental health burden and highlighted the need to act now. The United Nations has warned of a global mental health crisis and lack of action could have a devastating long-term social and economic cost to society with children and adolescents among those most at risk. It is commonly understood that the foundation for good mental health is laid in the early years and society as a whole benefits from investing in children and families. On the other hand, poor mental health in childhood and adolescence prevents children from fulfilling their rights and reaching their true potential. In itself, mental health is a prerequisite for physical health and is strongly interlinked with other development factors such as poverty, work and economic growth or peace and justice. As a cross-cutting issue, mental health has relevance across the whole range of development. Mental health should be mainstream in all policies, including citizen security and crime prevention initiatives. Research shows that good mental health might contribute to reduce violence and psychological interventions are part of conflict transformation as a way to break the cycle of violence. Psychological or psychosocial support is often included in rehabilitation of victims and witnesses following the occurrence of atrocities. This, we understand, is extremely relevant for, Jamaica, for the Jamaican context, where violence indicators have remained for a long time constantly high. As a matter of fact, Vision 2030, the Jamaica National Development Plan, has among its aims to transform Jamaica in a country able to provide quality and timely health care for the mental, physical, and emotional well-being of the people. Moreover, since, 20, since September 2015, mental health was included in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And that was indeed an historic step in which the United Nations acknowledge the burden of disease of mental illness and defined mental health as a priority for global development for the next 15 years. This was also included in the European Union consensus on development in 2017, where the European Union and its member states reaffirmed the commitment to protecting and promoting the right of everyone to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, so as to promote human dignity, well-being and prosperity. Many individuals and organizations have played a role in contributing to the inclusion of mental health in the SDGs, one of which is the global initiative called fundamental SDG. This group was a civil society initiative that has urged the UN to include mental health in the new development goals, targets and indicators. Therefore, the European Union will gladly continue to support any serious and credible civil society initiative that try hard to put on the public debate and agenda issues like mental health for children that are of urgent and paramount importance for the society. I hope that this report will contribute to accelerate the investments necessary to provide better mental health services to the Jamaican children. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Divins, for your remarks. Good evening, everyone, again. My name is Leanne Levers, and I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute. And welcome again to the launch of our report, Mind the Gap, the Inadequ Inadequacy of Mental Health Services for Children. So this evening's event will begin with a presentation, which will be followed by a panel discussion, including a question and answer session, which is largely going to come from you. As we're presenting and discussing our findings, we would love to hear from our audience by having you participate by asking questions and responding to our polls. In order to do this, please go to slido.com on any browser, enter the event code CAPRI, where you can post questions, vote up questions, and respond to our polls, one of which I believe is available right now. And you'll be able to see the responses or the results of the polls on the screen during the course of the event. Without further hesitation, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diana Thorburn, who will be delivering the main presentation of our report, Mind the Gap. Those of you who have been paying attention to what Capri has been up to lately might notice that we are doing a lot of work on children. Capri had never done research on children before 2018 when we partnered with UNICEF to produce the Situation and Analysis of Children in Jamaica report. That report left us with several questions, some of which we've since set out to answer. And this is what brings us to this report on child mental health services in Jamaica. We were struck particularly by the finding that Jamaica is far outside of international standards with regard to mental health services and its population. Nationally, the ratio of psychiatrists to patients is at one to 1,582, compared with an international standard of one to 150. For children, we noted there was a shortage of specialists in the country to treat children's mental health. Child mental health is important because most mental disorders that afflict adults have their genesis in childhood. Half of all mental health conditions start by age 14. Violence, poverty, family dysfunction, these are problems which affect, impact all people, but their effects on children are especially harmful. The internalization of violence impacts children's brains, affecting their social, emotional, as well as cognitive development, impairing them from cultivating positive interpersonal relationships and behaviors, and limits their ability to be effective contributors to society. The first five years of life are the most critical with regard to brain development, including the development of emotional control and habitual ways of responding. Directing investments and efforts towards treatment and support in the early stages of brain development would result in enhanced educational achievements, more positive adult outcomes, and boosted national development. When we speak of mental health here, we're speaking from the broad sense that mental health is a state of well-being in which individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Mental well-being implies the absence or mitigation of mental illnesses and disorders across a broad spectrum of conditions. The goal for any society is to reduce all mental health conditions and improve all people's mental well-being. So what are we facing? How many children are we talking about? We don't have good data. The studies that measure child mental health disease burden have been ad hoc and cohort specific, meaning they've been limited to one group of children. So there is no definitive or reliable account. We know that globally, 10 to 20% of children and adolescents are affected or afflicted by ill mental health. Estimates by specialists here in Jamaica suggest that of Jamaica's 800,000 children, approximately 20% have a mental disorder and 5% or 40,000 children have serious mental disorders. Other studies have told us that of adolescents, over, just over 1,000 adolescents, approximately 15% display depression and anxiety symptoms. Another survey in 2019 assessed broader indicators of emotional and mental well-being, showed that 45% of adolescents had consistently experienced anxiety symptoms ranging from feelings of nervousness, restlessness, worry, and annoyance. These may seem like normal emotions and feelings that any human being would have, 
But in children and adolescents, if these feelings are left unattended and persist, they can develop into more severe symptoms and manifestations of ill mental health. We also know from the data that we have that 60% of children in state care exhibit psychosocial problems and 76% of children in the criminal justice system exhibit maladaptive behaviors. All of this is to say that the data that we do have affirms the presence of the full range of psychiatric and behavioral disorders in the Jamaican population among children in proportions that we would expect based on the global evidence. Not included in this estimate is adolescence. Adolescence the world over, not just in Jamaica, is a period of maturation during which there are rapid cognitive, behavioral, and physical changes that are new to the developing person. It's characterized by an increasing indulgence in risk-taking behaviors such as early alcohol and drug use and sexual exposure, bullying, and other acts of aggression. Adolescents, therefore, almost by default, and even without a clinical diagnosis, have mental health needs beyond the known disease burden. There are other cultural, developmental, and epidemiological factors present in the Jamaican context that further imply that mental health challenges are likely to be prevalent, factors which, again, likely increase the existing estimates. We're speaking here to the quality of the environment where children and adolescents grow up, which shapes their well-being and development. Early negative experiences in homes, schools, and increasingly digital spaces, such as exposure to violence, the mental illness of a parent or other caregiver, bullying, and poverty, increase the risk of mental illness. What we call toxic stress is present in situations of extreme poverty, continuous family chaos, recurrent physical or emotional abuse, chronic neglect, severe and enduring maternal depression or repeated exposure to violence in the community or within the family. These are all characteristics of Jamaican children's lives, particularly those in vulnerable communities. The damage that toxic stress does to the architecture of the developing brain leads to difficulties in learning, memory and self-regulation and increases the likelihood that significant mental health problems will emerge either quickly or years later. Then we have to take into account the impact of COVID-19. Since the onset of the pandemic, experts around the world have grown increasingly concerned about children's mental health. Preliminary data from several countries has demonstrated that the pandemic has affected the mental health of children and adolescents and that depression and anxiety are prevalent. Where parents and guardians are contending with job losses and reduced incomes, dealing with multiple roles, being sequestered at home, household stress levels have increased. Capri's own research on the impact of COVID-19 has shown more than once that this is happening and violence against children has increased here in Jamaica. Challenges with accessing online classes and fears of falling behind in their education have affected children. In Jamaica, anecdotally, we have learned that the rate of suicide ideation among children appears to have increased and practitioners have shared that they have been receiving daily and more calls from children and their parents who are experiencing depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide. Having ascertained how many Jamaican children need mental health services, we then set out to measure how many children are receiving services or who are able to access services. We attempted to count how many children are seen in the principal mental health services in Jamaica, including the child guidance clinics, how many are seen in the context of the services provided by the Child Protection and Family Services Agency, the Department of Correctional Services, the Child Diversion Program, the Ministry of Justice Victim Support Services, and through the Reach Up Initiative of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and by two principal NGO programs that are offering a psychosocial support for children. Our tally was just over 13,000 children. Based on the estimate of the child mental health burden in Jamaica, not including adolescents or the impact of toxic stress, this means that 8% of child mental health needs are presently being met. We have a major deficit of child mental health professionals. We have only one child psychiatrist available for every 267,000 children. There are three general psychiatrists, three other general psychiatrists who have received additional training in child and adolescent psychiatry, but who have not received the certifications to be formally classified as child and adolescent psychiatrists. 
There are approximately 94 practicing psychologists and counselors in Jamaica and 28 psychiatrists overall. Of this number, based on our research, only 12 clinicians provide services predominantly for children. Six psychiatrists, 12 clinicians for 160,000 children. This is a wide gap. There are 23 child guidance clinics across the island. These are publicly funded and administered through the regional health authorities. These clinics are not facilities in themselves, but denote the days when mental health services are provided for children at different facilities within each parish. Only the sites in Kingston and St. Andrew and St. Catherine are open daily. Most are open once or twice monthly, and others are open up to eight days per month. The child guidance clinics collectively see approximately 8,000 children annually, which is substantially lower than the estimated 160,000 children who would need psychosocial care. Further, the child guidance clinics have challenges in responding adequately to demand with chronic staff deficiencies, reducing the possibility of successful outcomes for the children who do access their services. The opening hours are inconvenient, there are long waiting lists and low client retention. Children outside of the KSA and St. Catherine area have less, accesses, have less access to these and other services. There are other services available, which we have factored into our tally, but these do little to put a dent in the shortage of services available. And private mental health care is not a widely accessible or short option for many Jamaican families, as the cost is usually outside of most Jamaicans' reach. In any case, it would be impossible for the private sector as it now stands in Jamaica to provide care for all children, for all of the children who cannot access public mental health care. Then the question, why do we have such a wide gap in such an essential service? Why don't we have what we need? Low pay is a problem, and though it may be the biggest problem, debatable, it's not the only problem. Working conditions are poor, and the workload is burdensome, which leads to burnout, which in turn impairs practitioners' ability to provide quality care. The facilities themselves are suboptimal and equipment is in short supply. Further, there are gaps in the governance structure of children's mental health services, weaknesses in the interagency collaboration that ought to optimize children's mental health service delivery, inefficient data management, which we'll come back to, and the lack of adequate resources. This suboptimal coordination and collaboration among the various ministries, departments, and agencies working in child mental health subverts the true mission of these services. The ministries of health and wellness, education, youth and information, national security and justice all have programs to provide mental health care for children. But there is a lack of structured collaboration and formalized data sharing among these MDAs to facilitate the effective deployment of resources. Then there's a lack of adequate data. Data from public mental health care institutions do not offer an accurate or reliable assessment of the national disease burden. There's no baseline from which to measure change and we do not have the evidence that would be needed to plan strategically. Where do we go from here? We've established that there are a substantial number of Jamaican children who are suffering or may suffer from mental and emotional disorders and who lack the appropriate support or access to resolve their issues. Very often, these children go through different development stages undiagnosed. Childhood trauma and ill mental and psychosocial health persist into adulthood and impact on outlook, relationships, and productivity. This can potentially lead to or worsen what is already a cyclical crisis of violence and underperformance for Jamaica. So what do we do? We've described a dire situation, a serious predicament that we find ourselves in as a country, and it's not a new recognition, but how could we bridge this gap that we have identified? The most obvious recommendation goes without saying, more resources, more resources to be expended on and invested in child mental health care in Jamaica. This is not a new recommendation, but it has not happened and it bears repeating. Accessible and affordable mental health services for children provide a preventative system that mitigates risk factors and provides for early diagnosis and treatment. Where the environment is an important variable in the incidence and prevalence of mental illness, the environment in which most Jamaican children grow up is not conducive to mental well being. This goes beyond mental health and even public health. Issues of poverty, endemic violence, and family dysfunction require long term, multi sectoral policy change. 
and thus the need for early and preventive, preventative interventions for children is paramount. More specifically, there are evidence-based programs in Jamaica that address children's mental health needs, whether in preventative interventions or early direct treatment for children who have been identified with behavior problems that have been rigorously evaluated and proven effective. Reach Up, IRA Classroom Toolbox, and Child Resiliency Program are three examples of evidence-based, robustly measured, cost-effective programs that serve Jamaican children's mental health needs. Reach Up is particularly important because of the stage when it intervenes, the first three years of a child's life. The obstacles which hampered its smooth rollout as a scaled up national program delivered by the Ministry of Health and Wellness should be addressed as a priority. These initiatives, and there are a few others, show that in innovative evidence-based culturally relevant programs can forestall some of the unmet demand for mental health services. A program such as Reach Up, if adequately resourced and implemented across the island, could be transformative for the country. Other priorities to address this gap include incorporating modules on mental health in the high school health and family life education curriculum and in the teacher's training curriculum. These would contribute to greater awareness of and sensitivity to mental health, including destigmatization. Indeed, all school staff should be provided with mental health sensitization training. And there's a need for greater awareness of children's mental health among all state actors who interface with children. Strengthen the governance system towards more structured, systematized interagency collaboration on children's mental health and improve child mental health data collection and management. These would go a far way to bridging the gap that we have identified. And finally, but perhaps most importantly, we need to find a way to increase remuneration. Until we can find a way to increase salaries for internationally mobile child mental health professionals, we will never bridge this dangerous gap between our child mental health needs and the services currently available. The cost of catching children before they fall by investing more, resource in, more resources in expanded services and hiring and training skilled personnel might be substantial. But the money saved by not treating emotional, psychological, psychiatric, and behavior problems in early childhood is modest in comparison to the greater long-term costs of serious adult mental illness and or criminal behavior, and the inevitable economic and societal cost that is borne by us all. Thank you, Diana, for that presentation. I have to say that no matter how many times I've read the report, the numbers are always astounding and staggering whenever I hear them. Um, so we're going to ask for a very succinct initial response from both of our panelists um, in response to the presentation that they've just heard. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Judith Lango to begin with her few minute response and then Ms. Janine Brooks. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me today, tonight. The Ministry of Health and Wellness to congratulate Capri and the European Union in conducting this research on the mental health of children and adolescents. We have recognized that the resources devoted to this specialty have been um, inadequate, but in recent years, the ministry has really stressed mental health by the initiation of our helpline, Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Helpline, open to all ages, the um, establishment or initiation of a destigmatization um, public relations project, which, we, which should redound to the good of all our children and adolescents who suffer from these disorders, and also the telemental health services, which were developed during the height of the COVID pandemic. Although these uh, do not directly um, impact, so to speak, on the clinics themselves, but we see them as overarching initiatives which affect the mental health of our children. And we are, once again, let me say that we are delighted to participate in this presentation and hope that this presentation and its findings 
will redound to the benefit of all children and adolescents suffering from mental disorders. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Would you like to give your brief response? Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for having the Jamaica Mental Health Advocacy Network. Thank you so much for doing this report. I'm hoping that after tonight's discussion and after the report is made public, that these findings will uh, fuel some much needed change. As professionals, we are seeing these realities play out on the ground. I feel that some of the, the figures stated might actually be higher. And you know, it's very important that we're having this discussion now. So I'm looking forward to what comes next. So much, uh, Ms. Brooks. And just to remind you that you can go to slido.com to ask our panelists questions and to respond to the polls. Remember to the, enter the event code Capri and ask questions or vote up questions as we go along. So we have quite a few questions coming in already actually. And I'm going to ask, Diana, two questions actually, they kind of join together because you've mentioned this a little bit in the report. Someone is asking about the prevalence of mental health illnesses in uh, mental illness cases prior to and post or during COVID. Has there been a distinction between the two? And then also did the report make any distinctions in accordance with gender? So does the data differ for boys and girls? Okay, with regard to prevalence prior and post COVID-19, the data that was available to us, what we saw were two kind of opposite um, effects. One is attendance at child guidance clinics and other services went down, likely because people were staying at home and so on. There was an attempt by several services, child guidance clinics included, to uh, bring in telehealth type um, modalities so that they could continue to see patients. Um, on the other hand, we've also seen, and this is more anecdotally because the data isn't there yet, partly because it's too soon, but also we just don't have strong data on these things, is the increase in prevalence of depression, incidence and prevalence of depression and anxiety and other um, mental health disorders. So that would be the pre post COVID. I think the general expectation, and Dr. Leiber can probably, and, and Janine can probably speak more to this, is that there is an expectation that child mental health uh, needs are going to increase because of the pandemic. Um, with regard to gender differences, the data that we had did not um, speak so much to that, uh, in part because we weren't looking so much at prevalence and incidence. We, we were more interested in trying to get a sum total of the mental health disease burden among children. So we weren't breaking it down. We weren't getting as granular as that. Um, my understanding from what the information that we did have is that in some, uh, for some conditions, there are more boys than girls and vice versa. Um, suicide ideation, I think is more heavily, heavily in girls and in boys. Uh, don't quote me on that, but just to give a, an example of some of the few things that did come up. But again, I think this is something probably that Janelle and Judith could probably speak more to in terms of what the incidence and prevalence is different from boys to girls. Um, Dr. Lido, in addition to, in addition, in addition to answering the questions with regards to gender and the distinction in mental health illness or mental illnesses with regard to gender. Another question that we have is, uh, whilst there is a health and family life education curriculum in high schools, is there anything in place to further aid mental health development at the elementary level? Okay, thank you very much. So with regards to the, the gender bias, we, we, we find that we tend to have more boys being referred to the clinic than girls. And the reason being that the disorders which cause disruption in the classroom um, tend to be the ones that um, force the teacher or prompt the teachers to refer the children to um, our clinics. Um, a girl who is, or anyone who is very quiet and withdrawn um, may not you know, prompt the teacher so readily. So we um, have a 
preponderance or, or um, definitely a majority of boys come into the clinic because they tend to have like uh, disruptive disorders like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, conduct disorders. As, as Diana was saying, um, the girls do suffer more from like depression, anxiety disorders. The other question you asked was about the, the earlier, um, in the prime, at the primary level with regards to HFLE. I'm, I, what I would say is that um, we in the mental health unit have infused some aspects of what we call emotional intelligence into like the early childhood, um, the early childhood cu curriculum, uh, and we are we are trying to start a school mental health literacy. Granted, it's from thirteen up upwards, but we are hoping to um, also adapt it so we can have it at the primary level. Thank you, Dr. Lago. Actually, there are a few questions around what people can do at home to kind of bolster up the services that are already in place. So one of the questions is what extra effort can be made to accommodate children from low income homes that suffer from ADHD and are experiencing challenges with online learning at home? So I think that one is a little tricky in the sense that ADHD needs targeted interventions. So we know that the, the children are right now struggling. Some of the children are struggling with online learning. But the thing with ADHD is that it does need targeted interventions. Not being in the school system and having that source of meaning in the classroom, sorry, the physical classroom, and having more physical cues to draw attention back to the source can be a problem. So if a child is diagnosed with ADHD and the parent knows, and the parent is at home, which is another challenge with this online school, if the parent is at home, for example, parents can be in the same room with the children while they are doing their work. So that when you notice that the attention starts to shift, you can bring it back. You know, that's just a, a simple tool that can be use but of course you know there's different variables with this online school thing with connectivity and etc so that one is a little bit ticklish i'm not sure if dr Liber has any additional feedback the structure putting a lot of structure into the day a structure into their environment where they're seated trying to um bring them back to whatever they're doing and you might have to give them frequent breaks so that they can you know really focus when they are doing the schoolwork and of course um, making them do a, a certain amount of physical activity will also help them to focus when they have to do their schoolwork so it's a combination of factors and um, dr Daigo or these groups are there parenting programs that help to assist parents who are dealing with children who have mental health illnesses or just mental health issues in general? But, um, some of our clinics throughout the island have like group, they'll have group sessions where they'll get together a, a group of parents, maybe of, um, let's say, ADHD children or some other disorder, and they will sometimes go through like a 10 week or eight week um, it would program with them. So that, that's really um, what we tend to do throughout the, in the child guidance clinics. Apart from the individual, you know, instruction that happens at the clinic, as I say, we, we, we tend to have these, these group sessions last in eight to 10 weeks. And another question actually was true. I can go back to you, Dr. Leiber. Is there any governmental sponsorship for individuals who would like to become mental health professionals? So persons that would like to become trained in this area? I don't think there's a particular, um, let's say scholarship, uh, but certainly we have encouraged um, our, our health professionals to go and study in this area. And um, 
sponsorship can be sought perhaps from like the regional health authorities or the Ministry of Health itself for individuals to further their, themselves in this area. It's recognized as an underserved area and it's an area that we really want to encourage people to go, uh, um, to go into. Diana, this question is for you. Um, one of the questions that we're asking about the report specifically is how do you think that this report will actually help to fix or impact the gap, the resource gap specifically? Yeah, thank you, Leanne. There's this one small thing I wanted to point out when Dr. Leibo was talking about the gender differential and the girls who are quiet, so they are not you know, they're not seen as troublesome, so not as much attention is called to them. I think this shows the importance of the recommendation that we made about uh, training in schools um, for students in the curriculum, which is very important. For teachers, also very important. So one of the recommendations is to include mental health training in the behavior management module of the current teacher's training curriculum, but also for all people working in schools who interface with children, because so many children can escape undetected because people are not aware of what the signs are. They just think a child is quiet or withdrawn, not recognizing that they may that may actually be the symptom of something else. What do we think that this report can do? With any Capri report, the objective is to raise awareness among policymakers and the general public. Um, you know, if this can crystallize for policymakers and decision makers uh, the the problem that you know, one of the things that we we try to do is bring all the information together in a way that is clear and accessible. And so, if we can in our own advocacy with policymakers and at, at higher levels of stakeholders, um, share this information and the report in a way that helps them to see the situation more clearly and think better about how they can get more resources to the sector. That would be an objective. But I think it's also important when we put out a report like this or any report of that the public becomes aware of what the situation is. Um, you know, when we saw that first statistic in the CITAN of the ratio of uh, psychiatrists to the population, we ourselves were surprised. And we wanted to know why was this the situation? What more was there? And you know, some of the answers are somewhat obvious. You know, professionals are not paid enough. They easily migrate to places where they're gonna be paid a lot more. Uh, but we think that in bringing in all the reasons, as well as the data that show in very clear terms the situation that we're all facing, because this is a problem that faces every single Jamaican, not just parents with uh, children who have mental health problems. These are societal, national issues that all of us should be aware of. Then we can ourselves think, how do we mobilize, how do we... Uh, Put pressure on our policymakers. How do we lobby? Um, how do we lobby within our own children's school, for example? Even if it's not lobbying a policymaker or a politician to, you know, put more money into the sector. But these kinds of efforts of, of doing the report, having this kind of discussion, the objective is to really raise awareness among all people of what the issues are and what needs to be done to solve them. And then people can then have that information and figure out how do they move forward with that information. Just picking up on something that you said, that, I know, uh, is this idea of training. And Dr. Leibo and potentially Ms. Brooks, I'm wondering if there are any programs that are available or what training is in place for teachers, whether through teachers' colleges or while they're practicing that are available to train to provide training around mental health and how to respond to children that may have mental health issues. Let me begin. Um, they definitely have a module in the um, teachers training program, but you know that this sort of thing needs refreshment and reinforcement doing over and over. We, the Ministry of Health, we have had um, periods where we have done training with our teachers 
to try to um, get them to be able to, you know, recognize that this may be a potential mental disorder and to refer. So we have done that periodically through the years. Um, as I said before, we um, we we are trying to to incorporate a school mental health literacy program, where which would be more far-reaching, and um, so we're hoping that that will get off the ground maybe in the next few months, so that we can have more of our teachers being aware of you know mental disorders, linking liaising with um, our practitioners as well, and working together for the. the betterment of our children. And I know for us in a nonprofit sector under different forms of grant funding, we have done some training with teachers as well. But of course, with grant funding, you're limited to what you can do. So we may only be able to do five schools, for example. So those things are happening in the project world, nonprofit world as well but definitely needs scale up. And I know that the MH gap training that was stipulated by WHO is something that we could look into doing with our teachers, with our primary care physicians. Um, I would extend that to anyone who interfaces with children, like Diana says, like coaches, high school sports coaches, MH gap training and psychological first aid training, I think are, easy training modules to implement and of course with the refreshing and it gives the basic information that persons would need to identify and refer. Thank you. One of the other questions that has come up which I think is actually really interesting um, and something that maybe Miss Brooks you'd be able to speak to from a practitioner's perspective is and Diana brought this up in the presentation is this issue of toxic stress and how does one manage or address toxic stress um, or reducing toxic stress for Jamaican children given the environmental circumstances? Well, I would start from, from a preventative standpoint, so to speak, in the sense of teaching children from a very early age the value of emotional intelligence and proper emotional regulation. So when a child knows that here are various emotions that will be brought on by different forms of stress. Here are appropriate ways for me to manage. Here are appropriate outlets for me to express this emotion. I think that preventative way can help. And then when the toxic stress comes, which for some persons it may it may be unavoidable, I think I think the parents have to be in on whatever we're doing meaning in terms of training, sensitization, getting the relevant information. So they can also identify issues in their children before it gets too late, so to speak. And then providing proper outlets and teaching the children stress management techniques. And of course, early intervention is key. So when you notice that something is off, so to speak, with your child, taking the steps early rather than later is very important. And I think we have time for one more question and I'm going to ask Dr. Leiba to answer this question. Uh, given that we are now kind of becoming used to this new normal of the pandemic, have we seen a difference in the attendance of the child guidance clinics? Dr. Leiba, have you observed any distinction now that we've moved along a little bit further? with the pandemic? Thank you for that question. As Diana said, uh, well, we deliberately uh, tried to discourage face-to-face -face interaction initially by reaching out to our patients, trying to get them as up-to-date as possible with their therapy, calling them. Uh, throughout the pandemic, at the height, we were able to um, get, uh, institute telemental health with the assistance of UNICEF and the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information. And that was very helpful to contact our, our children. And a lot of our children are accompanied by older caregivers to the clinic. So we definitely, we did not want them coming out to the clinic. Um, 
So, well, now that we hope that the, 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 um, the thing is waning, <laughs> right? We have not begun to, I think, see the optic as yet. But I would think that by the end, by the end of maybe 2021, we'll see an, an optic. Because um, people are, are kind of ambivalent. They're kind of in a um, no man's land at this point. Um, and we in the health sector are really, uh, you know, asking people to abide by the restrictions as much as possible at this time as well. Let me let me just say, if you'd allow me, I'd, I'd like to um, pay homage to the Pan American Health Organization, which has been very helpful to us, particularly with the um, school mental health literacy program. We were able to have a virtual uh, training session in the midst of in July of last year, where we um, actually trained about forty trainers of trainer of trainers of trainer. <laughs> yes, so. Um, Pan American Health Organization and UNICEF as international development partners have always been very supportive. Thank you, Dr. Laibo. And I think we have run out of, not run out of questions. There are so many more questions that we have, but I think for the sake of time, I'd like to ask all of the panelists to provide some final thoughts on the presentation and the discussion of mental health that we've been having this evening. Diana, I'm going to ask you to go first. I think that the report and the discussion tonight has, what it has shown is that we have things, we have programs, we have training, we have initiatives. We just don't have enough. We don't have enough of everything. And that is a resource issue. And we're going to be continuing to, to grapple with the fallout of this lack of resources and this gap until we can figure out how we're going to to come up with those resources to put into this that's at the root of the problem i don't think we're lacking in knowing what needs to be done i think we all know what needs to be done certainly the ministry knows what needs to be done the the people uh, like janelle and her colleagues we all know what needs to be done it's getting the resources to do it at the scale that it needs to be done I think is a real challenge that faces child mental health. Ms. Brooks, any final thoughts? So definitely um, agree with what Diana said. And I think now that we have a better picture of what the gaps are, now we need to come to the table, all players involved, and find ways that we can fill the gaps in our resource crunch, essentially. I feel like there are ways that we can scale up some of the programs, probably not to the, the, the degree that we need, but it would be a start. So I think now the players need to come to the table to see what can be done through these different avenues that we have. You know, like I mentioned, the sports association, that kids are big in sports, maybe not so much right now, but how can we do some programs involving sports? How can we equip our coaches with information on mental health? You know, how can we give more resources and supports to the parents through PTA meetings, for example? So I just think we need to get creative because the resource issue, I feel, <laughs> is going to be here for quite some time, unfortunately, um, until the powers that be change that. So what can we do together doing a multi-sectoral approach to address this issue. So I think now that this report is out and we know the gaps, let's start plugging them as best as we can. And Dr. Tepo, do you have any final thoughts for us? Yes, I'd like to congratulate Capri and the European Union again for this report. Oftentimes the mental health needs of children and adolescents are totally overshadowed by those of adults. So seeing this highlighted has really warmed my heart. Although, yes, we are, aware, we, are, we are aware of the deficiencies and the deficits, but just bringing this to light is a, is a major first step, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And the Ministry of Health and Wellness, we certainly um, are going to pay a lot of attention to this report and start the process of trying to bridge some of these gaps. Thank you. 
I just want to thank all of our panelists, Dr. Diana, Ms. Brooks, and our main presenter, Dr. Diana Thorburn, for being here tonight and participating in this, in this discussion. And I'd like to thank all of our audience members who tuned in and participated via Slido. For those of you who didn't get your questions answered, Diana and I will be doing an Instagram Live where we'll be answering questions that we were un unable to answer this evening because of our time constraints. Um, so please tune in on Friday for that. And now I will turn things back over to Natasha, our comms of officer who will give our leaving remarks. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Leanne. There is a glaring deficit in the existing provision of children's mental health services in Jamaica. From the presentation and discussion, we saw that this is very evident. So more resources need to be expended on child mental health. We thank our researcher, presenter, moderator, and panelists for enabling us to elevate this conversation. Thank you to the EU and the good corporate citizens who support CAPRI's work in the public interest throughout the year. This report, Mind the Gap, the inadequacy of mental health services for children is now launched and can be downloaded from our website, caprecarrion.org. I will proceed to share the results from our first poll question. And the question was, what percentage of children suffer from a mental illness? And I'm seeing that 22 persons participated in the poll and 82% of the participants voted for 20%. And that is correct. 160,000 children in Jamaica are or may be suffering from mental illnesses. For our next report launch, you can stay tuned for that. It will be on June 24th and it assesses the effects of the pandemic on tourism in the region. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening.